Well, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to begin our third um, a third workshop in community archiving from the Democrat Democratizing Racial Justice Project. So my name is Alejandra Lenes, and I'm the principal investigator of this project, and I'm also the chair of the Department of Race, Ethnicity, Gender, Sexuality Studies here at UTSA. I'm going to introduce a little bit what the DRJ project is, and the Democratizing Racial Justice Project, which is funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and was envisioned by Dr. Jackie Cuevas with Dr. Rhonda Gonzalez and myself. It is a collaborative project among UTSA's Women's Studies Institute and the Department of Race, Ethnicity, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, Alamo Community Colleges, Mexican American Civil Rights Institute and the Institute of Texan Cultures to engage in community-based endeavors to envision and realize racial justice. Through site-based collaborations, Democratizing Racial Justice celebrates co-created community knowledge for just societies, transform access to the academy for people of color and first-generation students, and propagates transformative pedagogies in ethnic studies and the humanities. Democratizing racial justice, building on an established network of partners, brings together activist scholars, students, and community members to formulate community-centric ethical collaborations where people of color remember histories, respond to community needs, conduct collective research, and imagine thriving futures where racial justice is possible. Democratizing racial justice seeks to transform the role of higher education, ethnic studies and the humanities in particular, has in combating the erasure of people of color and their histories and reimagining a society in which people are equally valued. So now I want to move to introduce our community guidelines. So if you could, um, so please, we have some logistical guidelines and some community agreements, so please, Mute yourself when you're not speaking. Please use hand raising icon to ask a question when we're ready to ask questions. And please share your preferred name and pronouns. pronouns. Uh, and hold questions for the end of the session. As a community agreement, speak from your own personal experiences using I statements. Listen respectfully without interrupting. Respect Black, Indigenous people of color. Respect all gender identities identities and expressions and commit to dialogue rather than debate. So it is an honor for me to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sara Sanaida Gold. She is the executive director of the Mexican American Civil Rights Institute, a national organization collecting and disseminating Mexican American civil rights history. A long-term public historian, she has curated over a dozen exhibits on history, art, and culture, and was formerly founding director of the Museo del West Side and lead curatorial researcher at the Institute of Texas Cultures. She received a BA in American Studies from Smith College and an MA and PhD in American Culture from the University of Michigan. She's a former fellow of the National Museum of American History, the Winterher Museum, and the American Antiquarian Society. So Sarah, thank you very much for joining us for the third of this four-part series in Community Archives. We have learned so much about the importance of Community Archives and the work involved in this process. We hope to dedicate today's conversation to thinking through the details of a few projects as models or examples for archiving. This afternoon, let's brainstorm ideas of creating family archive, archiving a community project, and starting an archive on a specific topic. So let's open with thoughts about family archives. For those of us beginning to think more about family papers, photos, stories, and more, how might we begin to envision a blueprint for creating family archives? Sarah any, Sarah, any recommendations for sorting through materials and organizing it? For example, do you recommend organizing archive by people, decades, type of artifact, artifacts? What do you suggest? Okay. Um, the first thing I wanted to thank, oh, thank you for so much for having me back. Uh, this has been a fun series. Um, but the first thing I wanted to just ready to dive right into your question. Um, uh, if we want to ask ourselves for this family archive project, 
is the idea that it will become a, a digital project, um, which could be a really great idea, particularly if your family is spread out all across the country or even across multiple countries, a digital project might make the most sense. Um, or is it more of a physical thing, like when you get together for the holidays, um, you, you pull this out or people are asked to bring things um, and maybe it becomes this sort of physical thing. So those are things to consider and we'll come back to that in a minute. But first, uh, just to get to the idea of sorting through things, um, I, I do just wanna say this can sometimes be tricky um, because different types of things require different types of treatment. And so I was kind of thinking in my head of um, a scenario in which maybe your grandmother or somebody in your family kept a shoebox full of things that have different storage needs. So maybe in this sort of memento box, whatever this memento box is, maybe there were some photographs, maybe there are some postcards or letters, Maybe there's even, I was thinking of something organic, like maybe there's a, a dried flower or something from like a family wedding from a, a few years ago. Maybe there's also like a VHS video cassette of that wedding in this box. So these are different types of materials that ha have different types of needs. And so while on the one hand, it's really cool that they've been collected together in this memento box, that's probably not the best way to keep them. And so um, if the memento box has meaning, and I think it kind of does, right? I mean, the idea that whoever created it was piecing together these memories and putting them into that box. Um, what I would suggest in terms of long-term protection of those things is that you probably are going to need to separate those things from each other. But before you do that, you might just take some photos of the box itself, you know, opening the box photo of what is, you know, what all is in there so that you can see how, in fact, this was all arranged, um, you know, probably from the heart, right? Like it, to, to put those things together. But um, in particular, I hope when I said something about dried flowers that maybe made you think, wait a minute, what dried flowers? Um, and it's very common like that, you know, um, in books, uh, I know in, in my family, we have this big dictionary and we would sometimes stick flowers in there and press them, right? And then you forget about them. And then a couple of years later, you'd open it up and find these old crumbly flowers. Um, but um, the, the dried flower thing is, is, is somewhat uh, common, but because it is organic, it's, it's gonna require some different um, treatment. So um, nearly everything, just sort of a, a universal rule of thumb is that most things, do not live a long life under bright light, high heat, and moisture. So light, heat, and moisture are things we wanna just sort of keep in the back of our head here. Of those things I described um, in the box, in particular, um, the photographs are going to be very vulnerable to light damage. Um, light damage is cumulative meaning over time, the damage increases and it's also irreversible. So um, if you've got a cherished family photo in front of a, a window where the bright sun comes in, you wanna move that photo. I'll, I'll just show you an example. Right behind me, uh, I have photos of my grandmothers and um, they might look like vintage photos. And I mean, they, the originals are, but these are not originals. I actually have copies in the photo and the frames. Um, if you have original photos, it's better to keep them in a, a box, uh, someplace where they're out of light. And if you want to have things out on display, just make a copy. Um, and so, uh, you know, you can get copies at Walgreens or uh, whatever makes sense to you. But if you want to have things out, um, they will get light damage. You can also buy frames that have a UV filtering glass, but they tend to be a little more expensive. And so, you know, if you just kind of like to buy frames because you think they're cute, again, you might just think about using copies of photos like that. Okay, so going back to this, this idea of you've got this sort of memory box and different things are inside of it. Um, you want to go through it and check the condition of everything in the box. Does anything look like it's growing? 
mold or smell mildewy. Um, mold and mildew are contagious, meaning that they, they, they spread. They, they send out little spores and they spread. If something is moldy or mildewy, you really need to ask yourself, do I wanna go through the trouble of trying to preserve this? Because the reality is you may not really ever be able to completely get rid of that. And again, you don't want it to contaminate anything else. Um, if it's a treasured item, well, okay. If it, well, okay. First thing you can do, um, stick it in a Ziploc bag and seal it up and try to suffocate whatever is going on in there. Um, you can freeze it maybe. Uh, you want to be careful about what your freezer situation is though, because if you have a freezer that needs to be um, uh, defrosted regularly or like your, your frozen fruit tends to grow little ice crystals, don't don't use your freezer. <laughs> it's just some freezers uh, they have too much humidity going on. Um, but um, yeah, in 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 a lot of cases, if something is mildewy or moldy, my instinct would be, you know, like the Marie Kondo thing, thank it <laughs> and then get rid of it. Um, but um, uh, if it's in good shape, great. Okay, that's going to be step two. The other thing is, I just wanted to go back to the flowers for a second. Um, organic materials, whether we're talking about dried flowers or even we're talking about like may maybe there's an embroidered handkerchief in there. Um, fabric is, and, and things like dried flowers can be very attractive to certain kinds of pests, particularly moths and beetles um, and rodents. Um, if you see any signs of pest activity, um, we need to figure something out. So pest activity would include little droppings. Um, it could include little little holes, like something's been eating it. Um, unfortunately, for example, with moths, they tend to leave a, a smell that we can't pick up, which would make other moths be like, oh, there's something tasty over there. So um, if it were in fact this embroidered handkerchief, I would suggest, um, very gently, you could take a, a tub of warm water with like um, some wool light or something and just lay it in there and kind of press it down, press it down, press it down um, to try to gently wash it. You don't want to be like wringing it or anything like that, um, but just sort of gently do that and then rinse it several times, let it air dry flat. Um, and you can try to, you know, get any like pheromones out of there. Um, if there are any bug droppings or anything like that, of course, uh, you wanna check for any live bug activity. Bug eggs can be very small um, and they can also go dormant for a long time. And so you may not know it. And then next thing you know, they're hatching. And um, so you just wanna check for things like that. Um, if anything is um, like visibly contaminated, can you clean it? Um, maybe you can. Um, but if it's something that can't be salvaged, take a photograph of it and, and then I would suggest letting it go. The reason being it could contaminate the rest of your stuff and you don't want that to happen. Um, okay, uh, other things that might be in your box. Um, um, oh, let's say there's something in the box that has literally nothing to do with the rest. Like it just looks like somebody just threw this, um, uh, I don't know, this, this uh, un unrelated object into the box, um, maybe not realizing that that was a memory box. You might wanna, you know, at that point, take, make a decision. Does this really go with this collection or not? Um, but this would be a good time to sort of make that call. Um, if in that box, you've got photographs, postcards, letters, those are things that can be stored in either mylar sleeves. Mylar is a type of clear plastic. Um, and you can, um, you can buy mylar photo sleeves like at Michael's uh, craft store. Um, you can also use acid-free folders. And um, I was gonna show you, this is um, an acid-free storage box very typical what you would see in an archive. You can actually buy these boxes at the container store. 
which uh, the container store is in a, a lot of cities, not every city, but in a lot of cities. You can certainly board, buy them online, but if you only need one or two, the container store is a pretty quick, easy way to get them. And then inside of this, I have um, acid-free file folders. And so um, they just look like regular file folders. They're a little more expensive. They don't have any acid in the paper. So if that doesn't mean anything to you. If you've ever seen an old newspaper clipping and it's all yellow, kind of crumbling on the edges or something like that, that's because of the high level of acid that just is in cheap paper. And newspaper is printed on very cheap paper. Um, you might even have some like old paperback books that are having that same issue where the pages are turning yellow and kind of crumbling. Um, acid will, if it's, if it's touching, if the piece of paper that's got a lot of acid in it is touching another piece of paper, it, it will impact that, you know, otherwise happy, healthy piece of paper. Um, so sometimes when maybe you've even seen a newspaper clipping was taped to just like a regular white sheet of, of copy paper. And over time, that white piece of paper starts to look like it's got a stain on it. Um, that's the, the acid. Um, so newspaper clippings can be a little tricky. Uh, newspaper print, it just doesn't like surviving for a long time. But if for some reason you've got a clipping that has sentimental value, you can kind of make a little uh, envelope out of mylar. So it, like, it's clear, so you can see. Um, and that will protect other things from getting that acid on them. Um, but I will also just tell you that these days, many newspapers have been digitized. And so if your newspaper clipping is looking really worse for wear and you can barely read it at this point, chances are you can actually find it online. And I know it's different because it's like, that newspaper clipping, you know, your great aunt clipped that out and she saved it and held on to it. So it's got like a different layer of meaning to it, right, than the digital one you might find online. But don't beat yourself up if that thing is just not salvageable, okay? You can probably find it online. I would double check that it is online before throwing it out um, because maybe you can just put it in some mylar. Um, but um, again, you don't want something in that box damaging something that's not, you know, that currently is in pretty good shape. Um, the flowers, as I mentioned, um, they could potentially have some bug activity. If it's been in that box for a long time, the bugs are probably dead at this point if there ever were any, but you just want to double check. So what I would suggest is, you know, put it in a, a Put it in a Ziploc bag that's specific, that's uh, larger than it is so that you can slide it in there without damaging it. They make giant Ziploc bags now. Um, seal it up, leave it in there for a week or two. If you see anything crawl out, <laughs> you've got a problem, but probably nothing will. Um, at that point, I would then store it separate though from the photos and the postcards. I would try to make a little acid-free box. Um, the, this acid-free box that I showed you that was designed to hold file folders, you can actually just buy this board and make your own boxes. And you, you just use like an X-Acto knife to score the lines where you want the box to fold. And then you just fold the edges and you can just make your own little box. Um, you can also buy um, acid-free tissue paper at the container store. So you could, if, if it were particularly delicate, you could make like a little bed of acid-free tissue paper for, for the uh, flowers or something like that. Let's say you have in that box a VHS of the wedding that that flower was saved from. And I'm sorry, this is the only VHS I could find in my house. Um, so it's not a family, uh, anyway, it's just an old movie. Okay, but um, if you have any VHS videos, um, ideally you store them like this, standing up on their side. If you store them like this, and this is the same for cassette tapes, if you have cassette tapes. If you store them like this, you put a little bit of weight, um, or you know, there's the gravity is sort of pushing down on the actual tape that's rolled up in there. And so it can cause a little bit of damage. So the idea is to store them upright like this. Also, you always wanna store them having been fully rewound. So if you can see here, this, this side, there's no tape because I bought this from Blockbuster, obviously, um, but all the tape is wound up down here. Um, and that's what you want, right? Because um, 
the weight of it is down here. And um, so if you had it, like you had watched half of it and then you took it out, that half that was here would have this strip of tape hanging right here that has a lot of weight on it. And actually this stuff will stretch and it will, it will warp it. So better to have it fully rewound and then stored upright like this. Having said that, um, this sort of tape is kind of fragile. Uh, certainly you never ever want to touch the tape with your bare fingers if for some, I don't know why you would do that, but don't do that. Um, you can, um, you can like get little, A, you can get your uh, finger oils on there and, and it can start to then, your finger oils are kind of dangerous. They can start to eat into that tape, but also um, you, you can act, if it's starting to flake, if they, if they get too old, they do sometimes start to flake. You can actually kind of accidentally peel off some of the data on there. Um, if you've got VHS tapes, if you've got cassette tapes, um, you don't need to get rid of them. Just store them carefully. Don't store them in the garage, it's too hot. Don't store them in the attic, it's too hot. Um, but I would suggest if you have the means to get them digitized, um, especially if it's like family video, that's not replaceable. Well, actually, honestly, if you took this to try to get it digitized, I'd be like, you don't own that. You're not allowed to get it digitized. Uh, this is uh, copyrighted, right? But um, but if it's your family video and that's the only copy, I would definitely try to get it digitized. If you're in San Antonio, the easiest place to go is near the airport. It's called Matson. Um, I'll put it in the chat. Um, and they they can transfer all kinds of formats, whether you've got Super 8 video, like the old home uh, camcorders or beta, uh, VHS, cassette tapes, they can uh, transfer it to either MP4 or in the case of uh, cassette tapes, MP3. Um, but um, having that digital copy is then the copy that you would share most likely with your family. So for your family archive, if you've got family videos and you want everybody to have copies, you can digitize it and then easily share those digital files. And then you don't throw away the original um, VHS, but you just store it in a way that is safe for it. Um, and then use the, the digital copy as the one that you circulate. Um, what else am I forgetting? Let's see. Um, oh. Um, as you're going, thank you, Viviana, for the, the link there. As you're going through this box and, you, and you're looking at the condition that everything is in, this is also a great time to go ahead and scan everything. Even if you're thinking this isn't necessarily going to be a fully digital project, it just, you've got it out, you might as well scan it then. Um, and then um, if it's a three-dimensional object, something you can't uh, scan, you want to take photos, and these days with your um, with your smartphone, it's a little bit easier. Um, but I also highly recommend buying yourself an inexpensive tripod or um, uh, a photo stand. You can make a photo stand out of like a plastic bin if you've got one. Just cut a hole that you can put your phone on top of, and you put whatever your object is like on a table put the plastic bin over it, cut a hole for your camera uh, lens, which can be your phone, and then just shoot over it. Um, you can also buy a light box. And I know I just told you to beware of light, but here's the thing. If this object is something that's like been on your family's mantle or credenza or something, it's already getting exposed to light all the time. So putting it in a light box for a five minute photo session is not going to do any, you know, uh, go ahead and do it. But basically what you, you can buy like light boxes off of um, Amazon for $20, $30, you can make your own. Um, but the idea is just to create a way for you to photograph something without it being covered in shadows. And, um, and you can take pictures from multiple angles. Um, and then you can share those, of course, again, you know, with family and stuff like that. Um, but I think while you're doing that sort of, um, you know, check to see if everything's in good shape, it's a good time to go ahead and get things scanned. Ideally, you're maintaining some kind of database with all of this. You can use Excel, you can use Google Sheets. Um, you can, of course, upgrade to something more expensive. Uh, I know at a previous 
uh, one of these sessions, we talked about how there are some people who were using Instagram to create essentially community archives. And if, you were, if you're doing that with your family, uh, that's obviously very easy for family members to just all get on Instagram and follow that page and use hashtags to then um, say, you know, this is uh, Christmas 2021. This is uh, the Disneyland 1980 or whatever it is. You can use those hashtags to uh, categor uh, catalog things or categorize things. Um, I, when it comes to actually figuring out what are the ways that we're going to sort or, or catalog them, I tend to be partial to chronological, but I really think that's just me and uh, as you know, as a historian, I'm very interested in change over time. So I like the idea of categor uh, categorizing things according to kind of timeline. However, that doesn't always make sense. And so you really wanna ask yourself, um, in terms of making these items accessible, what makes the most sense? Because if this is a family project, does it make the most sense to catalog things based on this happened in 1977, this happened in 1980, this happened in 1990? Maybe, but maybe it makes more sense to catalog along sort of like major family things like weddings, Christmas, um, uh, birthday parties. Um, but it, it, I think it sort of depends on what kind of material you have and, um, uh, you know, uh, what you think people are going to be looking for. If you've got that Excel chart, you've got the various um, categories as it is. So if you are in fact looking for, um, I don't know, the time we went to Hershey, Pennsylvania, you know, you could, hopefully you would have a location category in your database. So you could just search for Hershey, right? But in terms of, do you want all of your family things arranged by location when in fact 90% of what's in your collection is from San Antonio, then maybe that doesn't make sense, right? Maybe you want to pick something else. Um, I know we were, we were gonna talk primarily about family archives and, and, and I'll continue to do that, but I did just wanna say, if this were in fact a community project, or a, a very topic specific project. For example, if this were an archive about a neighborhood or if this were an archive about Dahano music in San Antonio, you again, you'd wanna think, well, what category makes the most sense for people who are going to come and look at this collection? So for example, if it's a neighborhood archive, maybe you wanna arrange it by street or if it's an archive about Tejano music, then maybe you want to arrange it by um, band or or particular individuals like DJs, right, uh, record labels, uh, radio stations, things like that. So you kind of want to think, well, what what is what is our collection about? And um, hopefully that will give you some clues to how to best make the primary arrangement. And again, within your database, you'll have lots of different categories. So um, if it turns out that you're looking for something that's not the way you've primarily arranged things, you can still find it just by searching that. Um, okay, I think I answered your question. Oh my God, yeah, you did, and then some. So thank you so much, and it's a lot of things to, to think. Um, so you already talked about preservation. Um, so I think, uh, uh, any yeah. other recommendations, a, a little bit more on preservation and then maybe guiding principles for a family archive? I think you answered those, but maybe you want to add a little bit. Yeah, well, I did just put a link in the chat. Um, that's the Library of Congress's page on care for uh, preserving different materials. And it is, I mean, you can spend all day exploring the different sections in that page. But if you have specific things in there that you, like, for example, comic books. I know I just recently was trying to figure out how to best preserve a comic book that we acquired. And um, so there are just tons of information in there. Um, so please um, consider looking at the Library of Congress. Um, but also the thing that I, I wanted to emphasize is whether this is your family archive or another kind of community archive, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Meaning that you're gonna do the best you can to, um, to, to safely preserve your items, to catalog them. But if you find that the way you're doing it doesn't perfectly align with what is there on the Library of Congress's website, 
that's okay. Uh, what you are doing is better than nothing. And um, the, I, I, I think that what I love about community archives is this idea that, um, that we, we don't have to be so strict about how we handle things and that we can be a lot more open in letting people access things. Because I think traditional archives maybe not always, but there's certainly that reputation of safeguarding things to the point that they actually kind of limit access. And, you know, if you're, if you want people to know this information, like if you want people in your family to, to be able to not only share stories that they heard from grandma, but then also have, you know, great grandkids who will never have the chance to meet your grandma know those stories too, you want to make sure these things are as accessible as possible. Um, so um, just want to, you know, again, emphasize, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, it's it just those, those things that I mentioned before. Um, you want to keep in mind, um, light, heat, and moisture, and pests, those are like your four enemies. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't you know, again, I showed you how I keep photos here that um, they're right out in the open, but I don't worry about light damage because they're copies. Um, and, um, uh, you know, if, if you don't have the perfect situation for everything, it's okay. I'm going to do your best. Um, I mentioned you can buy the, these sorts of acid free boxes at the container store. If you can't afford to buy all of that, don't worry about it. What you do want to do, though, is if you're if you're looking through family things and you notice that they're mostly stored in like boxes that somebody probably picked up from the back of the grocery store. Like I'm sure some of you have moved before and like dumpster dived for cardboard boxes at the grocery store. Um, for a quick move, no problem. For storing family heirlooms long-term, please don't do that. The, the boxes from the grocery store tend to have a lot of bugs in them <laughs> and, um, and also uh, mold and mildew. Um, so you wanna at least have um, fresh boxes, boxes that haven't had food in them. Um, but, um, um, you know, as, as you maybe, um, as you're sorting through family heirlooms and figuring out what's the really good stuff, what's the, you know, sort of medium stuff, the really good stuff, the really valuable stuff, and particularly the really sensitive stuff, old photographs, um, any, any kind of old fabrics, like if you have somebody's wedding dress, um, or silk handkerchief, something like that. Those are things that are more delicate. Spend the money on the acid-free box for those more delicate things. And then, you know, maybe the VHS tapes, you can have them on a bookshelf somewhere, just store them upright and rewound, they'll be fine. Um, you know, don't put them in the garage if you can't avoid that. Um, but do the best you can without making yourself crazy. Um, the other thing is, is when you uh, maybe are having like a family gathering to bring all these documents together and figure out how do we arrange this, my suggestion is as friendly as you can, ask everybody, you know, keep your food and drinks over here. And then we're going to come to this table where we're going to look at the photos and look at the uh, mementos without any food or drinks, just in case there's any spills, because that can be a disaster. And, um, and then, um, you know, back when I started in archives in the 90s, the rule was every everything you did, you were wearing cotton gloves, everything you did. And the thinking of that has kind of evolved. Um, now, a lot of folks use nitrile gloves, which um, have more grip to them, because the, the problem with the cotton ones is if you were handling something that could potentially be slippery, like a, a, something that's glass or something, you might just, it might just slip right out of your cotton gloved hand, you know. Um, cotton gloves are still pretty good for if you're handling photographs, but um, the nitrile gloves are, um, they have a little more tack to them. So if you're handling something that might be slippery. Having said that, I also just wanna say that we have a major problem in the library, archive and museum world. And that is that we use way too much one-time use plastic. And so I think a lot of us are thinking about how do we stop doing that? And so um, I actually am trying to get more back into cotton, even though I think for a lot of people, that seems very old fashioned. 
but um, the, the plastic is kind of getting out of control. Um, if you have letters in the collection and they've been folded up, if you can open them up without damaging them, it's better to store them unfolded. That way for future people who wanna come along and read them, they don't have to keep folding and unfolding because that will weaken the fibers of the paper and it will eventually tear. Um, if there are staples, paper clips, post-it notes, please remove those. Um, staples and paper clips have a tendency to get rusty over time and then they like stick to the paper and then they rip the paper. Um, so you just wanna take those off. Um, Post-its, um, I love them, but they're full of acid. So, and that, that adhesive over time starts to harden and it becomes uh, like it'll tear the paper. So remove them um, and, you know, um, let's see, yellowed paper may not be salvageable. You might want to digitize it. Always ask yourself, is it worth the trouble if in fact this exists somewhere else? So for example, if your family has two copies of something and one copy is in great shape and the other copy is not, um, put your, your time and effort into the one that's in good shape. And that doesn't mean you just throw out the other one but don't necessarily um, feel like you have to put a lot of time and expense into that one. Um, let's see. Um, oh, if you have um, uh, things from generations in the past for your family project, that's wonderful, right? You can uh, digitize those, share those uh, with, you know, so maybe there's babies in the family and having those digitized copies of things will mean that when those babies are 12, 14 years old, they can look at those things uh, and use them for a school project about their family or something like that. Um, but that doesn't mean that your family isn't making history right now. So don't forget about the things your family is creating right now. So certainly the old stuff is very cool. Right now, I know all of us have um, probably done uh, Zoom calls with families or maybe even have like, family group emails or things like that. You can, um, of course, with the Zooms, you can save those. Um, you can save those digital files with family emails. Um, if for some reason you, you want to, again, a lot of people don't send physical letters anymore, but that doesn't mean that we're not corresponding. It's just we're corresponding in a different way, right? So you can take those family emails, save them as PDFs, and, um, and then save those PDF files um, so that you know, future generations can know um, the family didn't just stop talking to each other. They were just talking to each other in a different mode. Um, let's see. And sort of in terms of, um, I think that's. I think I answered your question. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, this is just at least for me. It's giving me a lot of ideas because my family we tend to try to preserve a lot of things, and we've done some of that and. And now I know what are things that I've been doing wrong. So that's really good. Cool. <laughs> <I know. laughs> so this has been really helpful. So let's move a little bit. Uh, we have we um, we have a little bit of time because I know there have been some people that already raised their hand to ask some questions. But let's move a little bit to community projects. Um, so you did talk about. So maybe we can think about. How can the process begin informally? What would be the advantages of having a blueprint? Uh, can you offer any ideas of crafting and adjusting mission statements? And you often mention the importance of scope. How might a, a local group frame its project to ensure, ensure a more successful archiving? Okay, yeah. I think that a lot of community archives start informally. Um, so, you know, there, there absolutely are projects that start very methodically. Uh, we are gathering today so we can start this community archive, but I think uh, quite a few just sort of happen because um, some community group realizes we've been generating a lot of, of uh, information about us and we haven't necessarily been doing anything to save it or to make sure that future people know about this. So it often is somewhat informal. Um, I was just thinking, you know, at, at UTSA, for example, there are all these student clubs and a lot of those student clubs are not necessarily new, but because you see students 
you know, pass through the school every few years, people who are currently a member of a student club may not be very connected to people who were part of that student club 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, and they may not know very much about what the club was like back then. Um, and in a way, if you were to think about, you know, creating a, um, an archive for a student club, that might be a way of connecting people who are current members to people who are past members and um, you know, learning from each other, but also just documenting the history of whatever that activity is. Um, so um, don't be afraid to start something if you feel like, well, you know, we didn't have our idea uh, squared away. And, and so now our stuff is kind of all over the place. That's okay. I think that's probably how a lot of archives start is, you know, their stuff over here and their stuff over there. Uh, and how, how can we start to get it organized? That's fine. And actually, I think it, it, it gives you this opportunity to um, bring people together around a project. This blueprint concept is, is something that we have been um, exploring for the last year at Makri. So when, when we were founded, one of our ideas was to create a digital archive focused on Mexican American civil rights history. However, um, I, I wanted to make sure that in doing that, we would not be reinventing the wheel. I know that there are archives all over the country that have been collecting here and there Mexican American civil rights history things that may not be isn't their focus, but they still have you know collections here and there. And then of course, there's tons of families that have this kind of stuff in their, um, in their homes. And so I wanted to make sure that uh, we weren't reinventing the wheel, that we were identifying the right partners for this project and that we would ultimately create a product, a, a, a digital archive that would be useful to people and not just a very expensive project. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we had a strong understanding, and I think this is important for any community archive, that we had a strong understanding of who our audience was, what their needs are, and what is already out there. Um, we want to build, part of the Blueprint project is us doing a lot of outreach, meeting with people at other archives, meeting with people who have uh, family collections, to build relationships with them, to see how would they like the things in their collections to be um, maybe promoted to a community that is very invested in Mexican American civil rights history. And, um, and what would a successful relationship look like to them? We wanna make sure that um, we don't necessarily come across as, you know, we're, we're the experts, so listen to us. We know that there's a bunch of other people out there, community people, right, who are in fact the experts of their own history. So we wanna make sure that we understand what makes the most sense for them. Right now, there are so many different digital platforms that you can choose uh, to use to build a digital archive on. And we wanted to make sure that we pick one that is user-friendly, that uh, is, is, has a strong emphasis on, on accessibility and that um, would make it possible for us to always identify the source of anything that we're sharing there, right? That this comes from the Mendoza family or this comes from the UCLA library or wherever it's coming from, well, but there, basically we have a lot of stakeholders in this project. And so we, the blueprint was a way of ensuring that all of the stakeholders get an opportunity to, to shape what it ultimately looks like. We're not done with it yet. Um, and so to me, this is very much one of these exercises in measure twice, cut once, you know? So like we're, we're doing all this sort of background work before we actually attempt to launch anything because we wanna make sure, um, again, that, that we're, that what we're creating is actually useful and addresses um, what we believe is a need, um, but you know, is, is it in fact 
you know, is that what the community thinks? That, that are we really making sure that we're addressing that? So that that's the idea of a blueprint. I think that what you see with so many community archives is this idea that before you really hit the ground running, you do um, listening sessions essentially. And so that's what that's what we're also trying to do, but at a, a certain scale. Um, our scale is bigger because the idea is for this to be national, but you can do this at a small scale too, where, you know, if the idea is, um, if the idea is a family archive, like maybe, uh, you know, everybody's going to be together at, um, I don't know, Christmas. So is that an opportunity to talk about if we were to do this, what would make sense for us? Like, would it be a website? Would it be a blog? Would it be, you know, uh, uh, maybe it's a MailChimp newsletter, I don't know. But I mean, what makes sense for, you know, you want your stakeholders to have some input there before you decide it's gonna be like this, you know? So um, our blueprint is just a little bit of a, a larger scale of that, but I think all community archives um, are, are doing good work when they start out with, well, first let's listen to the community. Um, in terms of um, mission statement, again, this is something you want to kind of work out with whoever your stakeholders or whoever your community is. And it, it very much ties into that idea of scope. What you don't want to do is sort of like bite off something that is so big and unwieldy that you're, all, you're kind of confused, you and your stakeholders are kind of confused about what exactly are we trying to achieve. Um, so having that mission statement, this helps keep you centered and keeps you focused. So um, I also just wanna say, be patient. Um, community, community work is slow work, meaning it's not like decision, decision, decision. It's more, you know, let's listen, let's, let's kind of marinate on that. Let's come back together, let's listen some more. Um, Let's throw out some ideas, see what come, see what see what seems to be a popular approach versus a not getting as much um, uh, positive feedback. It can take months, honestly, when you're trying to do a real community-led project to get to, okay, here's our mission statement, and and I think that's okay. Let like let that process happen, and and don't feel like you have to just churn things out, um, you know, after a one or two hour meeting. What you really want to think about with, with your mission statement is what are we trying to capture and who are we trying to capture this for? How will our audience engage with this project? And what is our capacity to run the project? Because is this is like an all volunteer thing, because if it is, then that's perfectly fine. But if it is an all volunteer thing, you want to make sure that you don't place uh, unfair expectations on your volunteers, right? Because they've got other things going on. So um, if it's gonna be a 100% volunteer grassroots sort of thing, give yourself fair and manageable goals with a mission statement that is fair and manageable for your all volunteer group. Um, if, you're, if you know, listen, we're gonna hit the ground running, we're gonna hire somebody, well then maybe you can be more ambitious, right? But um, if it, you just sort of want to keep that in mind because you don't want people to get burnout right at the beginning of your project because they feel like they're they're being asked too much. Um, so your mission statement can be very simple. It can be come up with a name for yourselves. We document and share the history of whatever that is. It doesn't have to be super complicated, but that will then become your guiding principle for your scope. What you don't want to do is say, we're going to document and share the history of um, the UTSA um, field hockey team. I don't even know if that's a thing. But let's just say we're going to document the, and share the history of the UTSA field hockey team. And then next thing you know, you've got members who are collecting things about baseball. You know. That's outside of our scope. Um, now, maybe there's not very much on the field hockey team. And so maybe you do need to then broaden your scope to, I don't know, uh, 
all sports, but I will just tell you, if you're going to do all sports, that's pretty big. Um, so just keep that in mind. Scope helps keep things um, focused. Scope help keeps, it helps keep things manageable. Uh, and it, um, what, what often happens um, in, I, I think as a field, um, museums, archives, and libraries are trying to move away from this because in a way it's like we became notorious for being what they would call the community's attic, meaning that it would just be like, things would just be dropped off. And it was like, well, it's from the community. It's from the, it's like, it's from Bear County. <laughs> um, it could just be any old thing. And then you just get overwhelmed with things and everything you take in requires um, care and maintenance. Um, and so it, it, it is something where you, you want to be careful about what you're taking in. Um, so, you know, if it's a family archive, you're not going to keep, you know, I don't know, every one of your grandmothers used Kleenexes, right? What, what's the value in that? You want to keep things that have um, some kind of meaning um, and, and some kind of significance. And so you sometimes have to be kind of tough um, and, and say, yeah, that just doesn't fit our scope. Um, and again, collections can get out of control quickly if you don't have a scope. Okay. Um, it is 1.52 and we have had some uh, questions. Um, audience members have been raising their hand to ask some questions, although we could continue talking about this all afternoon. So I think that for if, uh, and the first person I saw a hand was uh, Gabriel Hicks, something, I mean, that's if I remember that, that name correctly. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm, uh, um, I'm Gabriel Hicks and I go by he, him, his. Um, in terms of preserving, especially um, when it comes to photos, I like did just want to say this real quick. Um, there's something called a CPL lens, uh, which a whole lot of tattooers actually use. And like what it does is that um, is that uh, is that it like deflects any light from that picture and like just takes a really good, clear and like concise tattoo under really great lighting. Um, you know, so of course, like nothing, um, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, like nothing being shined on or like anything like that. So I did just want to say that real quick, um, you know, um, well, uh, well, just because like not too many people know about that. Um, I mean, like they're pretty cheap. Um, uh, uh, um, of course, like you can't get them through Amazon, but I do really recommend that when taking any kinds of pictures like that, just because it like really makes sure that like there's, um, you know, um, um, there's not going to be any glare or like anything like that. So, yeah. That's a great tip. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. At one point I have seen Nora Rodriguez hand. I don't know if you still want to ask a question. I did briefly. Um, thank you so much. I really enjoyed everything that you have contributed and thank you for, of course, the obvious post-its. I don't know why I've never thought about that before, but now I need to do a lot of work to remove them. Um, but I wanted to ask you, you mentioned something about sort of sharing family archives and platforms like, uh, public platforms like Instagram. And should you, should we tread cautiously about sort of the permanence of platforms like mm. that? Um, just because I think of like, you know, there are things that like on flash that are just no longer accessible, public, family and otherwise, or sort of like dead photo uh, sort of archives um, in the larger sense. Um, obviously I see their value and worth in the community sense, but should we also sort of, I guess maybe keep a backup. I don't know. It just, it seems like yeah. it gets, better, but it's sort of weird. Yeah. I've been thinking about no, that. It, it's, a, it's a major issue. I mean, just think about it. Like uh, probably some of you used to put pictures on, um, what was that? MySpace. <laughs> Those pictures are probably gone now. Um, or so. Photo bucket. Um, Photo bucket. That's the one I was trying to think of. Yes. There's a different ones yes. that are not, Right. So over time, the, the different um, websites that were places for sharing have gone out of business, uh, changed models, changed hands, whatever. And then, of course, there's also, you know, maybe, I mean, there's a little bit of ickiness around um, privacy and lack of privacy and 
so you have to take all those things into consideration. Um, on the one hand, Instagram is, is so easy to use, right? That's a big plus. But I mean, there are some real concerns about that whole company. Uh, so um, I, I'm not trying to tell anybody you should use that because I don't know that that's the right thing for you. And then the other thing is, um, uh, who knows, they, they could go out of business or they could, what if they started charging, right? What if they were like, okay, well, we're not gonna go out of business, but everybody has to pay $5 a month. I mean, do you wanna stick with that? And once you put something up on Instagram or Facebook or any of those sorts of things, if you then try to download it again, you, you can, but they have compressed it. So the image quality is not as good as what you originally uploaded. So it's not an archival, uh, like it, it's not archival quality. It's more about the easy access that I think makes it attractive. So what you would wanna do is if you are using like a platform like that, use that as the way that you, you know, like share things with your family and have conversations about it, but understand that somewhere in your computer or something, you need to be keeping the original digital file because you never know what's gonna happen with that. And, and so, yeah, um, if you want to have more control over it, I would suggest creating your own web page, um, but that's not exactly free either. You need a, a web host. Um, if you're, you know, if you're using something simple, like um, one of the drag and drop programs, Weebly or Wix, something like that, um, anybody can make one of those. But if you, uh, if you do know code, you know, you can make a, a really nice uh, WordPress or, but anyway, you have to sort of assess what is my technological level here and how much time do I really want to put into this, right? Um, yeah, um, I, I mean, honestly, though, I mean, you, you could be, um, I mean, maybe your family has a family Dropbox account, and you are putting photos into folders based on like, okay, you know, we just saw each other for Thanksgiving, everybody drop your Thanksgiving photos into this Thanksgiving folder. Um, you know, I mean, there's the, 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 the limitation there is, of course, then there aren't like, um, necessarily stories attached to it, but what you could do is you could put um, maybe a Word document in there too to have people sort of write a favorite memory in there that's in that same folder. I mean, not a pretty approach, but it's um, perhaps stable, I'm not sure. Technology is constantly evolving, and so you're going to have to be ready to migrate things. Um, you know, you might have um, I just remember when I was in seventh, seventh or eighth grade, eighth grade, I think, and my social studies class, we had a, a project where we all had to uh, use a cassette tape to record a family history, right? And so I had my grandmother tell a story on, on a cassette tape. I still have the cassette tape. I did get it digitized though, right? Because I don't even have a cassette tape player anymore. Um, but, um, uh, that's the sort of thing where, you know, you, you don't wanna forget that you have that because if in fact that mode, I wanna say it's MP3, if that goes, or maybe it's a move, I'm sorry, I don't remember what it is, um, but whatever that file format is, that might evolve over time. So you might have to go back and change things. Right now, PDFs and TIFF uh, files, TIFF files for images, PDFs for, um, documents are considered relatively stable, but don't, that may not be true in five years. Um, that's the technology is constantly changing. That uh, Library of Congress website I referred you to, I love that they actually update that every year. Um, and in fact, let me um, give you a very specific link. Um, if I can, I wrote it down here, here we go. This is um, recommended digital formats for this year, and they update it every year. And I wouldn't say it changes every year, but every five to six years, you can bet something in there changes. And so what is just nice is that as sort of a benefit to all of us, they just sort of keep us up to date on here's what we're recommending right now. Um, yeah, because unfortunately, 
formats change, uh, the machines change. So even like I, I mentioned, I have that cassette tape, but I don't have a cassette tape player anymore. So I've held on to the, the tape. I think it still works. I mean, I, but at the same time, who knows? I don't have a machine for it. Thank you so much. That 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 is the key. Be prepared to migrate. That yeah. I'm definitely going to take that to heart. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This has been an amazing discussion as always. And I want to remind people that the fourth of our series is going to be next Monday, uh, same time, one to, one to two. Um, so I hope we, you can join us for the last of our series for this year. We will continue to do this next year. So uh, again, Sarah, thank you very much for the three workshops that you had given us. You give us a lot of things to think about um, and how we preserve our, our knowledge. Because uh, as you previously have said, a lot of the official archives usually don't have our voices. And this is an opportunity for us to be able to preserve our voices, whether it's our families or our communities, and they're all really very much worth to preserve. So we really appreciate everything all the knowledge that you have given us through these workshops and we look forward for the fourth one next week. Thank, Thank you. you.